Okay, I just start turned on recording and um, I think we'll start for the evening. Um, as we gather, we are reminded that we're hosting this webinar on land, the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral peoples. We recognize and deeply appreciate your historic connection to this place. And we also recognize the contributions indigenous people, peoples have made in shaping and strengthening Waterloo Region, Ontario, and Canada. We are grateful for the opportunity to be here and reaffirm our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. We also acknowledge that people are joining us from across Turtle Island. Uh, now to go over some uh, general info. Um, we ask that everyone stays on mute and uh, with video off unless you are talking, uh, except for you, Judy. Um, background noises can be amplified with online communication and having less videos sort of helps with some of the legginess. We are uh, posting this uh, to YouTube and let us know by email if you'll have a problem with that. And uh, Matt, Stacy, and I are uh, volunteers helping things out. Um, you can either um, message, in, if you have a question, please message either Matt um, or uh, myself um, in a brief summary of the question and we'll let you know and turn the mic over to you. Um, and um, with that, I and we'll post upcoming uh, dates with uh, other candidates uh, also in the chat. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to now introduce uh, Judy. Judy's first political campaign was in 2019, where she was able to capture 12.7% of the vote in her riding of West Nova in Nova Scotia. Judy has been involved in many community outreach groups including the Digby and Area Community Health Board, a core action team member for Fresh Food Box Digby, and is a regional, regional representative for the Green Party of Nova Scotia in the Fundy Shore region. Uh, Judy grew up around uh, the armed forces as both parents were in the Air Force, and Judy served in the Canadian Forces um, as well as an airframe technician. She then went on to receive a master's in community science from Carleton University and has been a small business owner. Judy has lived in several areas of Canada in five different provinces and now calls Nova Scotia home. So welcome Judy Green. It helps if I unmute. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Teresa. Yeah, we should have the Zoom thing down by now, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I was born in, in uh, British Columbia and I now live in Nova Scotia where my husband is from. So his family is very much here. Uh, the Kitchener-Waterloo area, I have significant ties. My aunt and, and two cousins have been in Kitchener-Waterloo uh, their whole lives. And uh, we've had the opportunity to come and visit with them. And when I graduated from trades training in Borden, Ontario, they, they uh, traveled down to uh, attend my graduation. So it's um, a beautiful area. I've enjoyed visiting it in the past and hope to do so again in the future. Uh, you know, one of the things that I really want to do as a, a leadership uh, contestant, as well as just a green who's wanting to connect other greens is really uh, build those relationships in each of our EDAs so that we can uh, grow and learn together and share that knowledge and experience so that we can all uh, be better in our local areas in gathering uh, green support. So here in uh, Nova Scotia, it's Mi'kmaq, which is the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And I'm very blessed to live very close to Al Sitkuk, which is uh, Bear River First Nations. And I've had the opportunity to actually work with them, uh, coaching and teaching classes in their health center and have built significant friendships, uh, which I truly cherish um, over that time. Had the opportunity to work with them on uh, the missing and murdered indigenous women. And uh, we do outreach as a, a multicultural group uh, that is led by uh, Bear River First Nations uh, doing something called the Break the Chain Dance, which is um, 
uh, really started with Eve Eisner, but it's been uh, specialized to have an Indigenous uh, perspective and uh, used for uh, the missing and murdered Indigenous uh, women. And on the other side of me, Annapolis Royal, our mayor, uh, Bill um, has uh, McDonald, he actually worked on the commission for missing and murdered Indigenous women and children. And we had the opportunity to do a blanket exercise uh, in that community to help us understand what the reality and the real history of uh, First Nations has been across Canada. So there's been a, a lot of amazing opportunities here in Nova Scotia. Okay, um, well, thank you for that. Um, so just the initial question here. Um, what about the Green Party speaks to you? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it really surprised me because um, anyone who knows me would think politics, Judy, I don't think so. Because uh, there's been more about politics that I don't like, the traditional way of, of doing politics, than there has been uh, that I do like. Uh, you know, my son was eight years old, and I uh, had two years of him having been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, and he was better behaved than the MPs I saw interacting on question period on the television. So I, I really didn't have a lot of um, of faith in the way politics happens. There's this four year window. And uh, from the outsider's viewpoint, uh, that policy churn that happens when we bounce back and forth between uh, red and blue federally just didn't seem to be getting us anywhere. So when I started getting involved because of the IPCC report uh, in 2018, and I started looking at the Green Party policy, it was like, this speaks to me on a level that I've never seen before. I could have written these policies. And so when I ran, it was really easy to run as a, a candidate because if I didn't know the details of a policy, I knew the guiding principles and my instincts were right in alignment with what our policy was. So that really surprised me on a level that there, that could exist in politics. And um, I actually had planned on working with someone else's campaign, but that someone else never materialized. And so I ended up stepping forward and I'm sure there's lots of people across Canada who have had the same experience. <laughs> you jump off into the deep end and you learn to swim as you go. But it, um, you know, I, I really love that our policies have those core principles that guide them. I think that that is one of the things that's so unique for the Green Party. And we're also forward thinking, you know, being a member of the Community Health Board, we always talk about upstream thinking. And there's a really awesome little video uh, out there about upstream thinking. I, I suggest that you just Google it, video on upstream thinking, and it'll come up. Uh, it really explains it well. And we do that without even realizing what we're doing because we are future, future proofing. Our, our policies. And that is something that you don't see in the other, um, the other parties. Because I really think we have strong solutions to the problems that face Canadians. We just have to be a whole lot better at messaging that and getting that out to the Canadian electorate so that they can understand the breadth of policies and solutions that we have for them. We're all such policy wonks and being a nerd, I'm like totally in there, but we have to be better at communicating. Maybe just a quick question. Do you have um, an idea for um, a strategy on better communication? How to absolutely. get the, the word out? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we actually, we, some of the people that I've been meeting are amazing. Like we have a strength of and depth of experience and knowledge and training in our volunteers that we couldn't afford to hire. And we really need to be leveraging that at a national level and pulling these volunteers into committees that can work together to inform the direction that uh, federal council would of course make the final decision on, but really inform our, our direction that we go and how we do that. We have to also be, uh, have that really focused training. We need to be, uh, or message, then we need to be looking at it uh, and rolling out uh, resources that can then be customized in each of the ridings because we have this general overarching uh, vision for the country but each of us in our ridings have to be able to communicate that to our uh, people on the ground to our electorate in a way that speaks to them and coming from a, a business background I know that if 
I want somebody to uh, take a course that I'm teaching or buy something that, that I have for them, that has to solve a problem that they have. And so we have to get really good at it talking to people and explaining to people that are, are, we're listening to them. This is why listening campaigns are so good. We're listening to them. We hear the challenges that they're facing and we have a solution for it. And that is a strength that we have that no other party has. So we really have to get better at doing that consistently and providing those resources to do that and customize at uh, the EDA level in a way that the candidates take and the, and the, um, you know, the, the EDA itself, the organization has control over their local messaging that's still resonating within the global messaging. And I think that we can do that. There's ways to do that. I've been speaking to uh, even in terms of, of um, doing videos that can then be rolled out to each of the ridings and with instructions on how to customize and just add a customized piece that features the local candidate and one or two issues that are really important uh, to that riding. So, you know, there, there's so much knowledge within the party, we need to be leveraging that much better so that we can get that word out. We also have to stop waiting for mainstream media to talk about us. They're not going to, uh, because, you know, we have solutions, <laughs> we're not, we're not blowing up parliament. We're not, uh, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And, and right now nothing is, is competing, not even climate change is competing with COVID. And uh, I mean, coming from Nova Scotia, we've had a few things that have competed with it. We don't want to be repeating that uh, on a, a, uh, uh, a party level. So we have to really look at um, leveraging social media, uh, really working with alternative media sources to actually create our own media and uh, use our membership in order to disseminate that media across social media platforms. So provide the, the materials and the instructions on how to do that. And there's a number of different ways that we can, can roll that out, but we have to be way more proactive than what we have been doing. Um, Stacy, I think you had a question. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Judy, for joining us tonight. My question is, we have been seeing a lot of issues come to the forefront about systemic racism across our country. And I'm wondering, um, uh, related to that issue, I also noticed that the Green Party is, is not as diverse as I'd like it to be or is that as uh, would be beneficial for us to be and so do you have ideas on how we can improve that A absolutely Stacy and thank you for that question you know uh, it doesn't matter what board I'm sitting on or what what um, you know volunteer organization we all want to be more diverse and more reflective of what the um, demographic is across the board in in our communities and across Canada uh, but having that intent isn't enough to make it happen. And I was at um, Dalhousie University, the, the, law, um, the law school there had a, a really great uh, symposium just last year. And I was asking the speakers about this and they were, were from uh, several uh, different communities, including First Nations and, and, and uh, the black communities and asking how we could go about doing that. And, and it really struck me uh, how obvious uh, the response was. And it's after two or three or 400 years of oppression, why would they trust anybody? You know, these communities don't trust anything that is uh, part of the government, part of the system that has been oppressing them for, for 20 years. And that's, or pardon me, 200 or 300 or 400 years. So it is, um, you know, it's inherent upon us to help break down that whole colonial system and that co colonial thinking within our own organization to make it more palatable. And part of that is reaching out in an authentic way to people in the marginalized communities within our writings. And not just during an election when we want the vote. We need to build relationships and it takes time to do that. So we need to reach out and build those relationships and let them know that we want to know what they need from us. What do they need to feel safe 
in our organization. And at the same time, we each and every single one of us has to work on decolonizing ourselves, educate ourselves, start a book club. There are some amazing books uh, that are led by Indigenous uh, or written by Indigenous writers that can really help us understand the Indigenous experience. It's like there was They've been erased from our history books in school. So it's up to us now to fill in that part of our education that we didn't get in, in the Canadian school system so that we can really understand what, it, it, what um, their perspective is and uh, have maybe a little bit more um, you know, compassion for what's going on. But in order to gain um, you know, that authentic trust, we have to earn that within those communities. It's not enough to say, we have a place at our table. They may not want to sit at our table. You know, the space they want to sit in may look completely different. You know, it might be a circle, but it may not be. Who knows? We won't know until we talk to them and ask them what they need from us. How did that go with uh, the communities that you've worked with in BC? Uh, in BC, that actually worked really well, um, and, and it just kind of happened inherently because of where I lived in the Okanagan. Uh, we were just part of the, the different communities. Now, there's no black community where I grew up. I really didn't, uh, wasn't exposed to a black community until I was uh, working in Halifax at the post office of all places and uh, started to, to become more involved with the black community there, and there's a huge history of oppression in Halifax, you know, the, the, um, one of the bridges, the McKay Bridge, uh, caused Africville to be uh, completely obli obliterated. You know, uh, one of the, the other things that I learned when I moved to Halifax is that the largest pre-nuclear explosion that ever happened was the Halifax explosion. Didn't know anything about it, learned all things about it, and only this year did I discover that an entire First Nations community was wiped out by that explosion. That wasn't included in anything that I had read about the explosion up to then. You know, so we have really obliterated uh, First Nations and, and the Blacks and people of color from our history books. And that has to stop uh, for us to be able to understand what their collective experiences are and that these experiences are ongoing. This isn't what happened 200 years ago, 300 years ago. And if I hear one more person saying, well, they just have to get over it, I'm, just, I'm gonna smack someone, truly. <laughs> because it's still happening and our eyes have to be open and be able to stand up and say, that's not cool. I mean, look what happened on the prairies um, uh, when we had our, our regional debate on the prairies and we had the uh, Zoom bombers saying absolutely horrendous uh, racist and um, uh, things. Like, like it still happens absolutely every day. And can you imagine living your life um, where that's happened so often that you're on guard against that? in everything you do, you know, that's going to make you a whole lot less trustful of people who aren't living in your community. So just, you know, living with compassion and, and looking at things from other people's perspectives. Uh, and that's really, I, I've been very fortunate to have been raised that way, uh, but haven't always lived in communities where I could um, exercise that, but I have definitely done so when that opportunity arose. Um, Max, I think you have a, another that was yeah uh, David Weber asked this one um, and pardon me I, I don't have the uh, uh, I didn't do my research but uh, he asked uh, your military experience likely has allowed you to be more involved in uh, educational experiences that would shape your worldview and positions on international policy um, so how do you view Canada's international policies and in what way do you feel that they need improvements Okay, awesome. And that's a great question. And it, it's quite interesting because when I was in the military, it was during the height of our peacekeeping. And that really, even, even people who are, my son included, who are serving now, feel much more comfortable with the role of peacekeeping than the role of aggressor, which is the role that we've been, been put in in most recent years, often because of our, our allyship with different um, countries. And so we really need to relook at those relationships. And what I'd like to do is just like we have guiding principles for everything that we do with the Green Party, I think our international policy needs to be based on basic human rights. And that when we go into a country, it's to provide basic human rights and support for the people on the ground, not, not the reigning or governing um, uh, body. Uh, so there's a big difference between uh, the, the civilians on the ground that are most impacted by 
by uh, conflict and the uh, government of the, of the day that is making these decisions. So we really have to look at it on basic human rights. And that takes it further so that when we are choosing to trade with a certain country that perhaps we should not be trading with them if they don't have a level that we determine a level of basic human rights. You know, there we get a, a lot, Canada gets a lot of criticism over our friends and family discount that we give to countries like China or, um, you know, uh, uh, in the Middle East there. Gee, totally lost, lost. the ones that we send on military vehicles to who haven't been paying us. Um, you know, we really have to look, Saudi Arabia, there it goes. Sometimes the words wander off, they do come back. Uh, so Saudi Arabia. Um, so, you know, truly uh, we're being hypocritical if we say we're supporting basic human rights and yet we are complicit in actions of, uh, that are against basic human rights when we are selling equipment that's now being used against civilians in Yemen. You know, we have to be uh, authentic and true uh, to ourselves as Canadians, um, and certainly we need to do that within the party as well. You know, the Green Party gets called hypocrites a lot for driving a vehicle or flying a plane, because that's the only option that we have within the current system while we're changing it. However, there are things that we say, but then we don't do. So we have to be really careful about being hypocritical when we don't have to be or we shouldn't be. And that goes for Canada as well. And I think part of that uh, really bit us and stopped us from having um, success um, on the Security Council this year. And another thing with, with uh, policy, what I'd really like to see is that when we decide that sanctions or some action needs to be taken uh, because of the circumstances in a certain country. So uh, for instance, the annexation in Palestine. Well, you know, there's annexations that go on in other countries as well, in, including Tibet. So if we decide on a course of action for one country that's behaved in that, that um, manner, then we need to be applying those sanctions or those decisions equitably to other countries that are also engaged in those same um, oppressive behaviors. Uh, and and I'll uh, finish a little bit more because you asked about the military aspect. Um, I really do see us needing a military because we do need to be able to protect ourselves from others around the world who don't want to be as, as peaceful as we do. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, if we didn't, we'd have to rely very much on, on um, our close allies, which uh, kind of changes with the wind uh, in terms of how, how, uh, how, how we would feel about that. But really we have to look at what we're asking our military to do. We are asking our military more and more to be uh, reacting and providing support both in country and around the world for increased uh, uh, extreme weather events, uh, for search and rescue, for uh, going in and into seniors care homes in, during a pandemic and make sure that they're equipped to do things such as that. You know, I had, uh, I'm, right close here to uh, Greenwood, Nova Scotia, which we, my husband was stationed at. And uh, we lived there while I was doing my undergrad in computer science at Acadia University. And it, um, I was speaking to somebody during the last election. He says, yeah, you know, I've, I've been on search and rescue where we had to rescue a float plane from uh, the tundra where the permafrost had, had thawed and it had sunk. And we did not have the equipment to be able to do that. We had to go to a civilian contractor who had a Sigorsky uh, helicopter that's meant to, to lift um, uh, equipment and be able to rescue that plane. So we need to make sure they have the right kind of equipment. I don't see jet fighters being able to help in that circumstance. And I think we really have to rethink uh, what we want our military to do. Uh Simon, you had a question? I do, thanks, Teresa. Uh, Judy, what can the Green Party leader do to engage mainstream settler Canada in meaningful reconciliation with Indigenous people? Mm -hmm. And what does it say about settler Canada that we aren't engaged? You know, I, I think the big part of it is, uh, there's a couple of parts here. One is education. Settler Canada has one view of history that, that is not uh, truthful and inclusive. 
uh, you know, it, we need to be re-educating uh, all of us. And, and that means that we have to take responsibility on a personal level to do that, as I, I talked about earlier. But we also have to be, um, you know, we have to be um, looking at um, the systems that are in place that are inherently um, supporting a continuation of those atrocities. You know, uh, the way we have a, a, a misrepresent or, or a disproportionate representation in our um, legal system for people who are Black, Indigenous, or a person of color, um, looking at those systems that were in place or created for a certain uh, action that perhaps they're not suited, well suited again in, in future. So, I mean, the defund the police and the RCMP um, often come to mind with that because in some ways they are a symbol of the colonial system that's been oppressing uh, First Nations for hundreds of years. And in fact, the RCMP were, were um, brought into being in order to handle the, the Indian problem. Um, so, you know, we have to look at if they're really serving that purpose any longer. And I have a lot of people who've in my family who've dedicated their lives to, to police work, and they're great people. But the systems that are in place are sometimes uh, rewarding behaviors that are not serving us as a population any longer. And w with the RCMP especially, when I have a good friend who actually runs a, a senior's home now, um, who was RCMP for, for a very long time. And she said, from the minute that you walk into training, you were told you're elite, that you are the elite, you were above all others. And that in itself is very problematic in trying to work with other police um, organizations. And we've seen that here in Nova Scotia with uh, the, the mass shooter that happened uh, recently that was moving through different areas and the police, the RCMP were not communicating as uh, they were being moved through. There was no communication because it's, it's very segmented that way. Uh, so there's real problems. And we've seen this happen before with Canadian Airborne, where that, um, you know, that, that culture within that organization had gotten to a point where there was no incremental changes that were going to fix it. And so the Canadian military had to completely disband that organization and they have built a new one called a joint task force, which does the same sort of, uh, or is called upon to do the same sorts of uh, operations, but doesn't have that culture along with it. So I, I'm really appreciating some of these conversations around defund the police because it really, it is, it's in some ways, it's about um, fund them in different ways and fund the um, prevention uh, coming from within the communities uh, in order to uh, create communities that are healthier and safer and don't put people in a position where they feel they have no other choice but crime. And uh, we know from the research that this is the case and that we can do much better. But this is, again, it's a long term. It's not a four year fix. It's a long, long term solution that doesn't fit into our current political mindset or the other uh, other political parties. So we need to find a way to prioritize and incrementalize the solutions to make that transition in a way where it's not an us versus them. You know, so much of, of the conversations we get into end up being us versus them, and it isn't. It isn't polarizing. It's what's in the best interest of Canada. How do we right the wrongs that have been done in the past? How can we correct the mistakes in how we're operating so that we can achieve the future that we all want together? Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Stacy has another question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm always a little uncomfortable asking this, but I feel like it needs to be asked. If the Green Party decides that uh, where you're currently living uh, isn't the ideal place to run, are you willing to move? Absolutely. I get asked this question a lot, and as much as I, I love uh, where I live, and we wouldn't move our house. My husband would stay here. It would still be my little oasis. Uh, but I would absolutely be willing to move wherever the Green Party felt was the best chance of being elected, with a caveat. As long as the Electoral District Association in that area approved of that, I, I'm not a big fan of dropping in, um, you know, 
high profile candidates uh, on top of an EDA that may not want that. They may have a, a really good candidate for that area. So uh, we need to have that, that agreement uh, and that buy-in by the Electoral District Association before I would, would agree. And it may well be that I, that I would have to um, win the nomination against other local uh, candidates as well, because that's never a bad thing for an EDA is to have a contested nomination. Yeah, well, contest nominations can generate lots of buzz, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so why you, what differentiates you from uh, the other um, eight candidates? Uh, that's always a good, good question. And, and it's funny because this whole campaign, it's, uh, it's like we have two target audiences. You know, when we're talking to the media, we're talking to Canada at large. When we're here talking to EDAs and, and uh, Greens, we're talking about the internal green issues. And so it's almost like you have, have two visions and, and two messaging. Uh, so for me, what got me into this contest and, and why I'm still in it is because, as you know, we have some challenges internally. We have a rift within the party in terms of, of uh, wanting to govern from top down, do things the way that it's been done in other parties, you know, the standard um, uh, ways of doing things, or really reinvigorate our grassroots movement and uh, get people on the ground working uh, from the bottom up. And I am very much a grassroots person. It's one of the things that really attracted me to the Green Party. And I've been quite um, disappointed at how the, the party has been organized internally. Uh, that has resulted in the grassroots being uh, pretty much, uh, other than being elected onto federal council, being um, outside of, of decision making, outside of the, the very important work that needs to be done within the party. And when I finished my, my campaign, I kind of did postmortem on my own campaign and then started talking to other people in their campaigns and started to see that there was a lot of things uh, that we had encountered um, that were very similar. One of which was that uh, as a, a newer EDA, like we started with $36 in the bank account and the previous candidate who hadn't even read his emails in, in four years. So we had no team on the ground. We started from scratch in terms in those terms. And that was not an uncommon circumstance when I was talking to people across Canada. And I mean, I, I could go into all sorts of stories that were even worse, um, more challenging than that. But we have to be, you know, not um, just showing up for the election and then going away. We need to be supporting our, our EDAs on the ground, teaching them how to do outreach, be green, just be green in their communities, have fun being green, attract people, and um, look for ways that they can uh, work with other, other people in the community. I mean, there's just so many things that can be done, but the structure of the party isn't such that we are allowing that right now. So there needs to be that structure and those processes in place. And that's what my specialty is. It's about uh, really uh, pulling people together. I'm a unifier. I am like consent. I live in, and die by consensus. It's um, about people and, and getting to know each other, uh, building that trust, building something together. And that takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen just by saying, this is what we're going to do. So you need to understand that process. And not everybody has that experience. And that's what I wrote my master's thesis on. Being in high tech, that was something that, that most of my coworkers in Ottawa, uh, working Silicon Valley North, didn't have. And so the um, master's thesis that I wrote and wrote papers for that were accepted at international conferences, including Java One down in San Francisco and Uppsala in Vancouver, uh, and the Frontiers in Education, was all around that, about building those teams and those structures. And so that is um, something that I have that can really um, be put to use here for the party. I think all of the candidates are good public speakers. They would all be able to uh, you know, represent us on a 
global stage. Uh, so there's a lot of things we have in common. And my goal is to get all of us elected. You know, if we get uh, nine of the contestants elected in the next election, we have our three, at least nine of us. And then uh, the three who have uh, could get them reelected, we have official party status with nine MPs in parliament, which gives us a, a more time and question period and uh, many other um, uh, benefits from doing that. And then the next election, we need to uh, be official opposition. So uh, I think that the time is really ripe for us right now with COVID-19 and uh, understanding that organizational structure, understanding where we need to go as a country, uh, looking at processes like uh, I really like the uh, donut economic model our policies fit into those slots like they were meant to be uh, it is a really good visual for communicating our policies to the average person uh, really showing them that we can have a, a social uh, floor a, a foundation that everybody would be raised up to and then we also have to have an ecological ceiling so that we don't allow growth over the capacity for, uh, for what our planet can, can, uh, can handle. So it's really, really important that we have um, you know, somebody who can communicate some of those high level um, and very detailed uh, theoreticals into uh, the, to be able to speak to the average person on the door based on, on what they need and what, their, um, what the issues are for them. Oh, it looks like Teresa might be frozen. Oh. Um, thanks, thanks, Judy, for the, the conversation. Um, Absolutely. In, in the meantime, I've, I've posted um, some of the dates for uh, the other participants here uh, of the other upcoming Q&A sessions. And we're hoping to, just, um, to organize a, a debate with all the candidates on September, September 23rd. That would be uh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, Excellent. Well, you know, all of us, uh, all of the candidates are looking for the second round of nominations. We have 150 that we're collecting. And um, of course, we're all looking for donations to keep us in uh, the race. You know, if you liked what you've heard tonight, reach out to me at my website, www.judyngreen.com and uh, join the newsletter. We've got room on our campaign team. If you'd like to uh, practice some of your campaigning skills uh, to be ready for the next local election. And of course, donations. And I would like to challenge everybody in your EBA to go out and um, commit to talking to four people that you know uh, to join into join joining the Green Party. So it could be somebody who worked as a volunteer but isn't a party member. Uh, get them to put their their ten dollar uh, donation in so that they can uh, vote. Reminding them that uh, students as, as young as fourteen years old can be Green Party members and be able to vote for the leader in September. I like that. Challenge accepted. Excellent. <laughs> Does anyone else have any um, last questions for Judy or anything else that they'd like to say? I've got a quick question if I could. Yeah, sure. go ahead, Simon. Judy, how's your French? I'm working on it. You know, I've never, I didn't plan to be in politics. I've never had the opportunity to live anywhere where I could use French. What I've learned in school, um, I have if you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, I am working hard to, uh, to get my French up to speed, but I will never be bilingual. Uh, but I do bring something to the table that even somebody who's bilingual may not understand. And that is the importance of language and how language reflects the worldview of the people who speak it. It's uh, really made clear to me when I, ha I have friends who are language keepers here in El Sitkuk and how learning the words uh, really help you to understand how people view the world. And I'm finding that that's the same with French as well. And here we have Acadian French in Nova Scotia. We have in New Brunswick, we have New Brunswick French in, and we also have Acadian French in New Brunswick. Like there's at least three different dialects. Even in my own writing, there's two different dialects of Acadian French. So it's not as easy as saying, do you know French? It's do you know the French of the person who you're trying to talk to? So it's, uh, it can be a bit challenging. Uh, even when you do learn, uh, you know, 
government French, <laughs> which is what, what I've decided is the one that I'm going to focus on because it's uh, just uh, too much to try to learn all the different dialects before you've got the basics down there. And, and until that point, I've been working with a translator. So I take it as my responsibility to make sure that I'm understood. And so I make sure that, that I have a translator who can be uh, translating synchronously uh, for me. When, uh, and when we uh, have the questions in advance, uh, I have been, as painful as it may be for, for those who speak French well, I have been working really hard on my pronunciation and to try to at least um, attempt to uh, read the prepared statements uh, for in, in French. Uh, I appreciate people's patience with me as I go through this process. Well, thank you, Judy, for your time. Really appreciate um, you answering our questions and um, giving us more insight into the reason why you're running. Thank you. And, uh, I just see a message from Joanna. Oh. Yes, bonsoir. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining as well. And we hope to see you at some of the other Q&A sessions. Barb, I see you tuning in. Is there anything you, you wanted to add? Oh, you're on mute. Barb, you're just on mute. I just took myself, or I just put myself on video. I've been listening. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. I really appreciate uh, the time that you've given me here tonight. I always love uh, meeting people from all across Canada. Reach out to me. The phone number on my website is my cell phone. Uh, I want to be as approachable as possible. The, the email comes directly to me as well. And um, until I'll be as approachable as I can be until I can't be. <laughs> and going forward. Excellent. And we've uh, been recording this session, so we'll also be sharing the, um, the YouTube link uh, with you and uh, uh, the other members here in Waterloo Region, so Excellent. Uh, they'll get a chance to tune in afterwards as well. Wonderful. And if people are interested, we've been doing this amazing series of um, Getting Down to Earth with Judy Ann Green, which is our short little clips, a minute, minute and a half on different topical issues. They're filmed all around different uh, beautiful places in Nova Scotia. So you kind of get a little bit of a, uh, I, I, doing some of them, I kind of feel like a little bit like uh, I should be doing uh, shorts for the, the Tourist Bureau. Uh, but I tried to keep them topical and green issues. So, uh, so far the, the clear cutting one is getting a lot of, a lot of traction. So. <laughs> Great, I've checked those out. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining and have a good night. Thank you.